Hello and welcome to FACTS webinar, adding, uh, sorry, <laughs> welcome to FACTS webinar, antibiotics, antibiotic resistance and stewardship on the farm. Our guest presenters are Stephen Roach, Madeline Clevin and Gail Hansen. I'm Samantha Gasson, FACTS Humane Farming Program Manager and I will be moderating this session. Thank you for joining us. Before we dive right in, let me take a minute or two to do a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust or FACT is a national nonprofit organization headquartered in Illinois. It works to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a humane and healthy manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers through our humane farming program, promoting policies that make foods from animals safe and healthy to eat through our safe and healthy foods program, and genuinely keep consumers, help consumers make informed choices. And our, we have our two members of our safe and healthy foods program with us today, and that is um, Madeline and Steve, so we're excited to have them. Um, our Fund of Pharma grants are currently open and accepting applications. Please visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org to learn more about our farmer services. At this time, I'm very pleased to introduce our esteemed presenters, Gail Hansen, Fax Steve Roach, and Fax Madeline Clevin. Dr. Dale Hansen is a public health veterinarian and epidemiologist. Her professional expertise over the last 30 years blends veterinary medicine with public health, epidemiology, animal welfare, and communication. She consults on multi, uh, she consults on policy, antibiotic stewardship, and infectious diseases with healthcare, agricultural, pharmaceutical, consumer advocacy, uh, public health, and academic groups. Madeline Clevin is FACT's Safe and Healthy Foods Program Coordinator. Before joining FACT, Madeline worked um, in a laboratory setting, researching infectious organisms and their impacts on, uh, on public health. She completed her graduate degree in public health at UC Berkeley with an emphasis in infectious disease and, and vaccinology. Outside of work, she enjoys adventuring with her, her son, who is absolutely freaking adorable, dancing, being outdoors, playing volleyball, and doing photography with her husband. Steve Roach, in addition to directing FACT's Safe and Healthy Food Program, is a senior analyst for Keep Antibiotics Working, a coalition of advocacy organizations that have joined forces to combat the inappropriate use of antibiotics in food animals. He represents Consumers International in the Codex Committee on Residues of Veterinary Drugs in Food and at the Codex Ad Hoc Task Force in Antimicrobial Resistance and has served on a World Health Organization Advisory Group. Steve, who joined our team in 1998, has a master's degree in anthropology. We are lucky, so lucky to have Gail, Steve, and Madeline with us today. Um, it's amazing. I'm just so excited. Um, I am going to go ahead and end the poll, and I am going to go ahead and turn the floor over to Madeline. Madeline, please take it away. All right. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for the lovely introductions. <laughs> um, okay, can you see the slides? All right. Yes, they're not shared though. I mean, they're not. Um, they're not in presentation mode. Okay, perfect. Let me do that. Okay, I think we're ready to go. All right. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Madeline. I'm the Safe and Healthy Food Program Coordinator at FACT and I get to kick things off today. Um, I'm going to give an overview of antibiotic resistance. So at a very basic level, um, microorganisms called bacteria, think Salmonella, E. coli, can be killed by antibiotics. When a bacterium is no longer susceptible to antibiotics, it is antibiotic resistance, resistant, and it can cause a very difficult to treat infection. One of the primary drivers of resistance is the overuse or misuse of antibiotics. Antibiotic resistance poses a huge threat to society. Um, as Professor John Biddleton has said, a future world where bugs are all resistant to antibiotics will return us to the dark days of ineffective healthcare, condemn many to early deaths. Animal health and human health must be equally protected to save our antibiotics. Antibiotics are certainly one of the cornerstones of modern medicine. They're critical for so many medical interventions from respiratory infections to surgery or chemotherapy. 
So a world where our antibiotics no longer work is truly frightening. And unfortunately, even if we discover new antibiotics and they get approved for use without significant changes in how they're used in a shift in stewardship practices, the antibiotic resistance crisis will continue. Um, a crisis that could be responsible for 10 million deaths by 2050, the WHO has estimated. Now, since the beginning of civilization, animal and human health have been very closely tied together. And we still absolutely see that in our day. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, 75% of new or emerging infectious diseases in people come from animals. And we see many antibiotic resistant bugs coming from animals and making their way into the human population as well. In the latest threat report released by the CDC, a report that looks at the most dangerous resistant infections in the US, two of the threats deemed serious which together account for almost a quarter of the national drug resistant infections in people are resistant salmonella and resistant campylobacter. Now most salmonella and campylobacter come from animals, most infections, primarily through contaminated food or drinks, but there are other pathways as well. Yeah, two of the other threats listed in the report are MRSA and resistant E. coli, and we see transmission from animals to humans from those too. All that to say, it's very clear that in order to protect people from antibiotic resistance, we really need to protect animals as well. There's this critical linkage between the two. So now let's focus in on how food animal production contributes to antibiotic resistance. So if you look at the superbug origin story um, on the right of the screen, you can see how drug resistance and then multi-drug resistance occurs. And it starts with a very common process, bacteria that are residing in the animals replicate by the millions. Through that replication process, the bacteria will naturally develop mutations in the genetic code. Replication, especially in bacteria, is not perfect. You don't get the same cell line every time during replication. Mutations happen very frequently. And some of these mutations will naturally give a bacteria an ability to resist an antibiotic. It's not necessarily an advantageous mutation until that antibiotic is given to the animal. And then all of a sudden, susceptible bacteria are eliminated, allowing antibiotic resistant bacteria to survive and proliferate, leading to a gradual increase in the proportion of bacteria that are resistant. The more an antibiotic is used or overused, the more bacteria resistant to that antibiotic will dominate because those bacteria are at such an advantage. When a veterinarian maybe switches to other antibiotics or other classes, this process repeats so that over time, bacteria become resistant to more and more drugs. And as you can see by the cape and red eyes, they become increasingly more menacing. These multidrug resistant organisms become present in animal feces, can contaminate meat at slaughter or during packing. They can be washed downstream um, to other farms, farms with crops or the environment, eventually making their way to humans where they can cause very difficult to treat illness. So we're especially concerned about food production and more specifically, large-scale industrial livestock operations, um, where the vast majority of animals in the U.S. are raised. Whereas antibiotic sales in human medicine have remained, for the most part, consistent since about 2009, despite the year-on-year -year increase in the U.S. population, in contrast, sales of these same drugs for use in livestock have increased and now livestock sales 
of antibiotics are nearly double what they are in human medicine. And these are just sales of medically important antibiotics. So antibiotics, which are shared between humans and animals. These are the drugs that we really worry about overusing in animals because not only do bacteria resistant to medically important antibiotics limit treatment options for animals, but they limit treatment options for humans. Now we're seeing um, resistance on farms and feedlots to drugs like carbapenems, um, cephalosporins, which are reserved for last resort treatment options for certain infections in humans. Oh, sorry. Wow. That went a little while. <laughs> okay, so is there hope? Of course. So facts vision is that all food producing animals will be raised in a humane and healthy manner and everyone will have access to safe and healthy food. FACT has a wonderful growing network of humane farmers also committed to this vision. And healthier, happier animals generally produce healthier meat with a much lower risk of contamination with drug resistant bacteria which contributes to a healthier food system. And it's important to keep in mind that every time an antibiotic is used in any setting, whether it's on a humane farm or a large feedlot, there is a risk of selecting for resistant bacterial strains. This means that antibiotics really should only be used when absolutely necessary to protect the health of the animal. And the same goes for use in people, too. In many very highly intensive livestock systems, um, unfortunately, antibiotics are not necessarily used when absolutely medically necessary. Um, for instance, the vast majority of beef cattle on feedlots are given medically important antibiotics to prevent liver abscesses, um, brought on in large part, part by poor diets that don't contain enough roughage. Um, we see in pigs, um, many baby pigs will be weaned perhaps too early from their moms, making them more susceptible to gastrointestinal infections. And often this is um, prevented by routine antibiotics. Now, while there is no stopping um, antibiotic resistance, it's a natural process that occurs, we can absolutely slow it down and keep these medicines working for longer. And I know Gail will um, talk more about this and finding a balance between use and risk of resistance. So to conclude my section, um, preserving our antibiotics is very important. While we are all at risk of getting a resistant infection, certain people are at a much higher risk of both acquiring a drug resistant infection and subsequently dying from one. Those working in the meat industry, for instance, face higher risks from occupational exposure to resistant bacteria workers who are in contact with food animals during slaughter or with the meat products derived from them, which can be contaminated with antibiotic resistant bacteria are at risk for becoming infected. These workers can then carry these antibiotic resistant bacteria home to their families or their communities. Then the millions of people in the United States who are suffering from chronic illness, cancer, kidney failure, or undergoing surgery are also at a much higher risk of getting a resistant infection and dying from it as well. And these are the people who need antibiotics the most. Um, personally, when I was diagnosed with cancer about six years ago now, um, I became acutely aware of the value of antibiotics. And it's made this work much more personal to me. 
Um, it truly takes effort from everyone in all sectors, not just in food animals, but in human medicine, companion animals, crops, and we can all do our part um, to keep our antibiotics working and preserve them for those who need the most. And I will pass it over to Steve. Yeah, uh, thanks, Madeline. Hi, everybody. What I'm going to talk a little bit about is, um, you know, how the federal government, because a lot of our work uh, addresses that, uh, at least what it, what who has responsibility for addressing the um, antibiotic resistance problem, particularly the ones that we're most interested in as food animal concerns trust in the animal uh, sector. And so I, I think a lot of, you know, I, I work on this stuff all the time, but I think a lot of people aren't so aware of who does what. So I think the first thing is just like, who is responsible for the safety of animal drugs? And the, the answer to that one is um, the Food and Drug Administration, particularly uh, it's divided up into different centers, but the Center for Veterinary Medicine is a center that actually regulates animal drugs. Um, and they also look at animal feed. So to make sure that we aren't feeding things to animals that make them sick or make us sick. Um, there is some role for the Department of U.S. Department of Agriculture, the veterinary services over at APHIS. And the, so while the Food and Drug Administration regulates uh, animal drugs, and that's uh, very broadly defined as anything that either treats a disease, diagnoses a disease, um, or things that modify the structure or function of the body. So there's a lot of things that fall under what is drugs. Um, they, that even includes uh, genetic, genetically modified organisms. So if you have an animal that is more resistant to a disease and you've used uh, some genetic modification technique to make it happen that way, that would be regulated by the uh, FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine. Um, USDA regulates some of the, uh, most of the crops that are um, genetically modified, but the FDA is, it would be in charge of animals. Um, and the other area where they would do some regulation if you had a genetically modified animal feed, because that falls under theirs. So, but the, the one area for animal health that is not regulated by um, uh, uh, the FDA is actually the vaccines. So in the U.S., vaccines are uh, regulated by, for in food animals, or in actually all animals, are regulated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So that's kind of a, a little bit different. And then I did put the Environmental uh, Protection Agency up there, because like the pour on tick medications, some of those are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and other ones are um, uh are regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. And there's actually trying to figure out, make sure that they're getting that right. Because it used to be, if you poured on a tick and flea medication and it was absorbed, that was Food and Drug Administration. If it stayed on the surface of the animal, then that would be Environmental Pre Protection Agency under the pe pesticide regulation. But they found that those uh, boundaries aren't very clear. Um, and the other thing US Department of Agriculture does is um, at slaughter, they will test for residues of uh, veterinary drugs in meat, and then they report that back to the FDA. The FDA then talks to the one person that produced that animal about, okay, you shouldn't have allowed this you know, this drug to be used that way. Um, next slide. Okay, so what does FDA do when it regulates uh, animal drugs? So the basic thing is if you want to use a drug in an animal or market a drug in an animal, it has to be shown to be safe and effective. So effective just means does it do what it's supposed to do? Um, and the second thing is the safety. And the safe should be safe for the animals. I will say in some cases it looks like the FDA isn't that great at looking at animal safety. We have some animal drugs uh, that were growth promoters in the beta agonist class that seemed to cause a whole bunch of health problems in FDA uh, seems to look the other way. Um, and those are just used for production purposes, but they are supposed to make sure that the drugs are safe for the animals um, if used correctly. And then for drugs that are used in food producing animals, um, then we have a, a human food safety review. And for a long time, that mainly covered 
looking at drug residues to make sure part of the drug or uh, something that's created in the body from the drug doesn't cause a human health problem. Um, so most of the drugs we have have what something's called a maximum residue level. That's how much of the drug product can actually end up in the meat. So when industry talks about, oh, all of our meat is has no antibiotics in it, most meat has some antibiotics. They're just at a level where FDA has decided it's safe enough for us. Um, and that's managed through a withdrawal period. And as I said before, USDA does its tests, but then they report them back to the FDA. And then since 2003, uh, a new drug, so they didn't go back and cover the old ones, uh, all, any new drug approval would require an antibiotic resistant assessment, which is, is better than nothing, um, but it rarely has resulted in the drug not getting approved. So next slide. Okay, so... FDA has to approve the drug. And then when it approves the drugs, it sets the conditions for how it can be used. And so an important thing to know about animal drugs is they need to be used according to the label. So you can't take one drug approved for another animal and use it another one. You have to use it at the right dose. Um, you have to use it at um, for the amount of time it says on the label. Um, and so I thought this is, so there are ways to use a drug in ways that they aren't approved, but then you have to go through a veterinarian that writes a prescription for that. So um, so in either case, if you you need to use a drug, how what it tells you to do on the label. Um, so in a lot of part of that is you can't use it right up to when it's slaughtered. You have to use it for an amount of time. Some can't, you can't be used for more than two weeks. Um, and you can only use it for what it's it's supposed to be used for. Um, so, and that's where I, it says indication, duration, withdrawal perks, and some will say there's certain classes of animals you can't use them on. Um, you know, you can't use it for lactating dairy cows. That makes sense because there's residue issues with, uh, with the drug getting the milk, or it may say no use in uh, pre-ruminating calf, veal calves, so you can't use it in animals um, that would be slaughtered, you know, as, as veal. So, okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so I, I did mention that you can use a drug off-label sometimes, but it requires a prescription with a from a veterinarian, and that you have to that veterinarian the the rule actually says the veterinary has to know that animal in those farms, or at least know the farm and what you do on the practice. Um, I think the problem we have in our you know with the very big farms is the veterinarians you know they visit once a year, but there's multiple groups of animals, so they they don't have a lot of details on those. Um, and you cannot use an extra label drug in feed in any case. So a veterinarian cannot write an order telling you to use a drug for uh, in feed for something that it's not been approved for. Um, though FDA has uh, enforcement discretion, so it, it can overlook for minor species. And that's anything that's not a, uh, a cow, a pig, a turkey, or a chicken for the food animals. Um, Everything else is a minor because there's a, because of a lack of drugs. FDA says, well, we won't really enforce this rule on those. Um, so, and again, as I said, that would be a change in the indication duration dose or any use. And the other thing you could do extra label is you could use a human approved drugs in an animal extra label. But again, you need to get a vet to write an order for that to make it legal. And then there's certain drugs that are known to have health specific health problems um, that, that, again, you're not allowed to use those extra label. Um, and some of those are uh, drugs that are pretty bad because they've been known to cause cancer. So we don't want to use them in, in food animals. Um, and I would say uh, there was actually news that came out today. The FDA announced that they had written letters to um, online pharmacies that were allowing, were, were basically selling some animal drugs uh, without prescriptions. And so uh, those were mainly for companion animals, but who's to say that either somebody doesn't take those and use them in their food animals or doesn't use them themselves. And both of those would be uh, not very healthy. Okay, next slide. So the other thing is, is it, FDA has rules. So if you wanna use an, antibi an antibiotic and feed, 
Um, those are ones that are medically important, kind of like the ones uh, related to the drugs used in humans. Again, you, there you don't use a prescription, you use something called a veterinary uh, uh, feed directive. And so it's kind of like a prescription for animal feeds, but it has a, some different rules. Um, it's used, required for all medically important antibiotics use in feed. And I think I have a complete list on the right here uh, of all of those. Uh, um, the ones in red aren't actively marketed right now, but they are uh, legal for um, to be used. So they have approvals, but nobody's selling them. Um, you must follow the label and you can't use it beyond the expir expiration date. And an interesting thing with the veterinary feed directive rules is you need to keep a copy of the veterinarians order that VFD for two years. So there are record creeping requirements for uh, livestock producers on, on these, uh, these drugs themselves. Okay, ne next slide. Okay, so that's kind of what FDA does. It's supposed to show that the drugs are safe and effective, and then the people that buy the drugs are supposed to use them according to the safe conditions that FDA has set out. Um, so, but fact thinks that FDA hasn't gone a, a far enough in protecting people against antibiotic resistance. So our biggest concern is that we really need to stop raising animals in ways that make them get sick. So as Madeline mentioned, if you feed cattle a, a high uh, energy diet, you get these liver abscesses and that makes them sick. If you take a baby cow, uh, pull it off its mother, you know, abrupt weaning, put it on a truck, ship it across the country, uh, move it through a, uh, a sail barn, and then group it with a bunch of other animals, um, uh, then it's very likely to get sick. And even with a bunch of antibiotics, uh, bovine respiratory disease is really bad on U.S. feedlots. Um, so we think the biggest thing we need to do is raise animals in a better way so we don't need to use so much antibiotics. But we do believe that animals should be treated uh, uh, when they're sick, or if you're in a group of antibiotics and you know a disease is moving through them, you can treat the whole group. Um, but we do think banning preventive use, a lot of what they do in the, in the large facilities is they use antibiotics because they aren't providing healthy conditions for the animals. So you know you're always getting animals sick when you um, wean your baby pig. So you just uh, run them, you inject them all with the antibiotic and then put a couple of weeks later, you put some antibiotics in the feed. Um, so that's not uh, that's something we think we should not allow because it basically allows these unhealthy conditions. And then uh, monitoring antibiotics and then setting targets for reductions in antibiotic consumption. So, so that's what I have. Somebody asked, what's the difference between highly critically? Um, so FDA has ranked drugs by how important they are um, to each other. And um, so the most important ones are critically important. We use those to treat infections that are very serious. And um, I'm also very often likely to come from animals. And then highly important are not quite as important. And then important are ones used to treat things that aren't so important. And you also have more options. So, OK, I'll turn it over to Gil now. OK, hi. Getting, getting all my stuff here together. So um, I'm going to be talking about anima, antibiotic resistance, specifically with farming. And the two things I have here, things are getting better, things are, are bad, is sort of to remind us that you can really hold two thoughts in our heads at one time. Um, we can see the possibilities without saying, don't worry about it anymore. Um, I'm kind of an optimist, so it's like providing hope for the future. So sort of in the, the late 20th century, modern farming was, was the sort of get big or get out. So agribusiness is seen as being good for the, you know, for the national interest, um, resulting in sort of this monoculture of growing one kind of crop or raising just one kind of animal. And it really diminishes the biological and genetic diversity for, so that you can get higher yield potentially and potentially greater efficiency. Um, but it also contributes to antibiotic resistance. So I wanna talk about some, some basic pr principles here and um, next. So, presuming that we all agree that antibiotic resistance is complicated. If it was simple, we'd have figured this all out, out by now. Next. And presuming that you know, our goal is to preserve the effectiveness of, of antibiotics, both for people and for other animals when it's needed. And that antibiotics are given to animals, um, that are given to animals contributes to antibiotic resistance. There had been some discussion um, in 
some big egg, especially that um, that antibiotics used in animals didn't uh, didn't result in antibiotic resistance to, to people, but we now know that's crazy. Um, we also know that the uh, antibiotics get into the environment. Uh, the drugs that are given either in feed or in water go through the system, the animal system, and some of it gets used, but a lot of it um, goes through the system unchanged. So then you have a combination um, in the animals, especially the animal's feces, of having um, unchanged drug itself. So the antibiotic itself gets in the environment. Uh, the resistant genes get into the environment and the antibiotic resistant bacteria get into the environment. Um, and composting, because there was a question, I know there have been questions about composting. Composting sometimes will make a difference, but not always. Um, so it's, um, uh, it, it's not, composting is not gonna be the cure-all for that. Um, next slide, please. So some basic presumptions. First of all, that decreasing antibiotic use slows resistance. It's not going to stop it, as mentioned before, it'll, but it'll slow the creation and the sort of the amplification or the, the spread of antibiotic resistance. Next slide. And that we can reduce antibiotic use without um, compromising animal health. That it's still, we can still preserve the effectiveness for humans and other animals when we need it. Um, and we can do that without compromising animal health or welfare for that matter. Next slide, next. And that concrete actions we can take and we should take to reduce the use. So we can, you know, we want to retain sustainable and regenerative agriculture. And we also want to continue animal welfare at the same time. Next slide. So as I said, antibiotic resistance is complex. Um, antibiotics are what are called societal drugs. And so what do I mean by that? So most drugs are not societal drugs, they're personal drugs. So if you take medication for high blood pressure, for example, if you take it today, it doesn't affect how it's gonna work on you tomorrow. It doesn't affect how it's gonna work on your next door neighbor. And it's not gonna affect what's gonna to happen to somebody taking high blood pressure medication in another state. That's not true for antibiotics, right? So one person's use or one animal use of an antibiotic can diminish the effectiveness of of that antibiotic either for that animal or that person the next time they use it or even the next day or um, for other animals in the herd or even for, um, for, for people or animals not even connected to the farm because it can get into the environment because it gets, um, because that resistance um, is, is a problem. So that's the sort of the unintended consequence. We certainly want to use antibiotics to treat and they, they work very well to, to, treat, to treat some bacterial infections. Um, but but we do have some unintended consequences. And it's a, you know, so it really becomes a community issue or a public health issue. Um, and that's also sort of trying to remember that the drugs don't work on the animal or the person. So you might say, well, this antibiotic didn't work on me. It doesn't work on you, it works on the bacteria. So sort of keeping that in mind that it's that it's that bacteria, it's the bacteria that become resistant. We don't become resistant, the animals don't become resistant, the bacteria becomes resistant, and that's what the, the issue is. Um, but perspectives really do matter. And, and everybody, I truly believe everybody is trying to do the right thing. But next page. But not everybody has the same perspective. So not everybody know has the same idea of what it means to do the right thing, um, especially as it comes to as, you know, relates to antibiotic um, resistance or stewardship. And so farmers may may think about things one way, the, the, you know, the large industrial farming complex, if you will, thinks about it another way. Drug companies have a different idea of what that antibiotic stewardship means. And um, consumers have another one and, and policymakers have yet another one. Next slide, please. And, you know, sometimes antibiotics must be used for the health and safety of an animal. You know, if there's an if there's a bacterial infection, that's exactly what you need to do. But if they're used when they're not necessary, or if they're used as a sort of a crutch for bad husbandry, um, the results mean that resistance occurs faster and can be spread more more widely. So every animal, every person that gets an antibiotic is a potential reservoir and amplifier of resistance. And we raised a boatload of animals. And you know, if you think about the fact that we raise about 10 billion animals in the US every year, 
Um, not all of them get antibiotics, which is a good thing, but each one of them is a potential reservoir and amplifier of resistance. Next page, please. So this is how a lot of uh, the general public thinks animals are raised. Um, they, it's not exactly reality anymore. Uh, the next, thanks. This is really how most animals that go into our food supply are raised on, on large farms. Um, and the really the social and economic well-being of communities would benefit if there are a larger number of farms rather than these giant farms. And um, even though industrialization may benefit some, it really rarely benefits the, um, you know, the, the farmers or the rural communities. In fact, it, it may give farmers, you know, fewer opportunities, but that's a whole other topic. I'm not going to go there. Next slide, please. Next. This is really how most people think about food. You know, I, and you may think that this is just a comic, this doesn't happen, but I honestly have talked to somebody with a, with a master's degree in biology, no, it wasn't biology, but a master's degree who thought that you could, um, so she could get her chicken wings that farmers would just cut off the chicken wings and then the, the chickens would grow new ones. So there's a lot of misinformation about farming in general. So next slide, please. So let's get to what what can I do? What can, can you do on the farm? Because it looked like from the poll, it looked like most of you are in farming. There's a few of you are not, but most of you are. So the first thing is, you know, we want to preserve antibiotic treatment options for people and animals. And sometimes antibiotics are exactly what you need to treat an animal for the health and the welfare or the well-being of the animal or the herd. But we should be thinking more sort of upstream, what can we be doing before we get to that point? So sort of thinking about prevention. So husbandry would include um, decreasing herd density, um, feeding changes, as was mentioned before, making sure that ruminants get um, roughage, that just giving them corn and soy is not a, is, is just hard on those animals. It's not what they're, they're designed to do. Um, having access to the outdoors, having better housing, um, also mentioned before, sort of maybe later weaning, thinking about breeds, um, sort of consider the, the health traits or the immune capabilities of the animals, as well as how fast they grow or how much milk they can produce, how many, you know, how many eggs they produce before you can't use them anymore. Um, you know, culling chronic mastitis cases, for example. Um, closed herds would be ideal, but rarely practical. But remember that the cheapest um, price at the sale barn for replacements are not always the cheapest for the herd or for the farm in the long run. Um, because you, you know, if that animal's sicker, then you're you're gonna waste time and resources um, to, to treat that animal um, instead of starting out with the healthiest animals you can. And then of course, cleanliness, uh, hygiene, cleanliness and disinfection is next to godliness and having a good running farm and reducing the need for antibiotics. Um, and then using antibiotics if you need to, because sometimes, as I said, you absolutely need to. So next slide. So what else can you do? So, you know, if you do have an antibacterial um, uh, infection, um, what are your, you know, what are your op options? First of all, make sure that you have an accurate diagnosis. Make sure that you're treating an, uh, a bacterial infection. If you've got a mycoplasma, if you've got a, a virus, if you've got a, um, a food issue, antibiotics are not going to help you. Um, you know, there's a physician who says, you know, if you take that antibiotic, it's going to get better in seven days. If you don't, it'll take about a week. So make sure that you're, that you're actually treating a bacterial disease that an antibiotic will work on. Um, and then making sure you have the appropriate antibiotic and um, even potentially looking at, is there an alternative that exists to that antibiotic rather than using an antibiotic? So treat only as only as far as you need to, only as many animals as you need, but treat if needed. You know, that, that gets back to the welfare of the animals. We want them to be healthy. We want them to have good welfare as well. And then as Steve mentioned, the veterinary client-patient relationship. So that means working with your veterinarian, having discussions with him or her, um, trust your veterinarian. Um, if you don't trust her, um, it may be time to get a new one. And I, you know, I'm a veterinarian, but I've not been in practice for 20 years. Um, so I would not be the best person to ask, but, but presumably you have, uh, you know, you're working with a veterinarian who knows you, knows your far farm um, and is keeping up to date on, on sort of the best things to do. 
So next slide, please. So what else can you do? <laughs> well, advocate for change. And I know everybody's got a ton of things they need to do, but um, both locally and nationally. So better farming and regenerative practices, farming practices should be compensated. And you know, there should be fair prices for farmers for better practices. So the Farm Bill, nationally, the Farm Bill is coming up probably this spring, so it's not too late to contact your member of Congress. It, they don't get a lot done, but they always want to seem to get the Farm Bill done, so that's the good news. Um, look at what's going on locally, what's going on in your county, what kind of policies can be done to um, decrease the amount of antibiotics or to, to make it easier for you to farm um, using fewer antibiotics you know, writing letters to the editor to get people's awareness up so that you don't have people saying, I wish I could find bacon seeds to grow my pigs. Um, you know, and there may be some other local options. I know organic can be tough um, because in the US, uh, they don't allow you to use any antibiotic um, and call yourself uh, and, and be able to sell as organic. That's different in the EU and the UK. So that may be something you want to be... Um, advocating for of, can we do the same thing we do in the EU, that if an animal needs an antibiotic for its welfare and health, and that's the only thing that will work, that should be able to be done under certain parameters and still keep an organic label. So you, in the EU, they have to keep the, they have, the withdrawal is twice normal and they can only use it a certain number of times on a farm. But, um, you know, another way to, to sort of looking at that. And then sort of personal market choices. And now I'm going to speak both to the to the farmers on on the on this webinar as well as uh, to those who are not. And that's to think about where are you getting your meat, where are you getting your eggs, where are you getting your poultry, where are you getting your dairy. Get them from sources that you that you can support and that use minimal antibiotics. Um, so you know we really all need to be good stewards of the antibiotics and the land. And then there's the, I'm going to make a plug for the CRAU option. So next page. So what's CRAU? CRAU stands for Certified Responsible Antibiotic Use. And it's the first um, responsible antibiotic use standard that has been verified by USDA that allows for minimal use of medically important antibiotics in animal production. Still allows for some use, but under some, uh, some fairly strict guidelines. And there are... Um, CRAU guidelines and, and actually um, you can become CRAU for beef, pork, and turkey. Uh, there used to be chicken standards, but we, uh, we meaning the CRAU folks, have since pulled those back because they've sort of gotten where they wanted to with that. So the CRAU standards were developed and managed by the, got to get this right, the Antibiotic Resistance Action Center at the George Washington University. The standards are transparent. Um, everything about the standards, how to get under the standards, um, what's being used to audit them. It's all on the web. They're all publicly accessible. Um, the farms have to undergo a regular um, audit, and it's by USDA. It's not a third party. It's uh, audit on site uh, to substantiate that they're conforming to um, to the standards. And they they uh, re-audit them. Uh, CRU folks decided to go with uh, USDA because at some point, at some level, at least, USDA is, is, has to be response, they have to respond to the public where third party auditors and the companies themselves really don't. Uh, and like I said, CRAU really um, sets a floor, not a ceiling. If you're interested in the CRAU, uh, the, that's the USDA website. Um, you do have to have a P, what's called a PVP or a QSA um, and then a specific audit on your farm. Um, if you have more, uh, if you're interested in that, as soon as I'm done here, I can put my name uh, and my contact information in the chat. I can't talk and do that at the same time. Um, or you can contact the folks at FACT and they can put you in, in um, you know, in touch with the, the, C, the folks at George Washington U University and, and the CRAU um, program. So next, next slide. So this is sort of coming to the end, sort of, you know, why should you care? Um, because antibiotics are the first line of defense against bacterial infections, and we don't have a lot of new drugs that are being developed. So when these are gone, um, all you've got is thoughts and prayers. Um, and physicians are now seeing that with uh, humans, that they've got drugs that used to work that don't anymore. 
And the veterinary community is now starting to see that as well. And we don't want to be in that place um, that Madeline talked about earlier, where we're back to sort of the, the Middle Ages. Um, and because antibiotic resistance affects everybody, it affects your herds or your flocks, it affects your pets, it affects your it affects the wildlife, it affects people, it affects the environment. And um, next slide, and with that, I'll stop and it'll be time for us to do questions. Wonderful, thank you. That was amazing, you guys. Um, I, I really got a lot out of it. I especially like the um, cape wearing uh, super bug with red eyes. That was fantastic. <laughs> uh, so we do have some time to take questions, which you can type into the Q&A section or in the chat bar. And I'm going to run a poll really quickly, if you wouldn't mind. Um, having this information is very helpful for us um, as we get funding and um, uh, that type of thing. Hold on. There we go. So I'm going to run the, the poll and go ahead and uh, collect your thoughts, get a drink, Gail, and uh, <laughs> take a break, take a breather for a second or two. And um, we will go ahead and get into our questions. There we go. All right, so the first question I have is, um, Gretchen was, I like that she goes, oh, say more about antibiotics not helping microplasma infections, please. <laughs> I love that. She had an exclamation mark, very cute. Um, some antibiotics can work on some mycoplasmas, but it's um, you're gonna be better off trying to avoid it. And I know, especially in turkeys, mycoplasma can be, and cattle respiratory is a huge issue. So, you know, it truly is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So if you can <clears throat> avoid it, um, either getting it onto your farm or into your flock is a lot easier than treating it. Um, the antibiotics we have available are just kind of okay. And you have the unintended consequences of, of antibiotic resistance. So um, that's why I say if, if it's a mycoplasma, let's think about something besides throwing some more antibiotic at it. All right, thank you. Tammy would like to know what on-farm micro lab operations options, sorry, are available. The Royal Milk Institute has info on somatic cell count, but there, but is there an option for bacterial testing on-farm labs so that cultures can be done in a more timely manner? We're still sort of back in the 19th century where we're still, you know, growing bacteria on agar. Um, Though there are some there's some newer things that are coming up. I know physicians have exactly that same issue of, you know, how can I do a bedside, you know, or or patient side um, uh, test? And there are some coming up. Um, Steve from Madeline, you may know more. I don't know of anything that's cost effective at the the farm level, though. Yeah, I, I think the problem is a is a cost. So I, I do know actually very, you know, a large, you know, some of those large very large facilities. If you're raising ten thousand animals, I think some of those folks have have labs. Um, but I think right now the 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 yeah trying to get on farm lab and on farm diagnostics is something um, like every meeting I go to where we talk about it, people are talking about needing better diagnostics, and that's what the the lab work is. But I think we're we're pretty far away in terms of. Um, uh, having something that's practical, particularly if you're not uh, raising tens of thousands of animals at a time. All right, thank you, Steve. Diane asks, my vet had all clients sign a form recently related to future use of antibiotics. Do you know if there are any protocols in place now for vets when prescribing antibiotics, especially when working with factory farm settings? Sorry, I, I missed the first part of that one. Oh, sorry. And Diane asks, um, my vet had all clients sign a form recently related to future use of antibiotics. Um, I don't know what the form, what the, what it was. I don't know if you, Diane, if you want to sort of share a little bit more about the form. Do you know if there are any protocols in place now for vets when prescribing antibiotics, specifically when working with, fact, in a, with factory farm settings? I I. Don't. Um, I do know that there are a lot of veterinarians who are asking for um, different forms to be filled out, some for their own, um, you know, for themselves so that they can say, yes, there really was a veterinary client patient relationship. Um, others? 
Yeah, I, I also know that, again, if you're a big enough place, they will start developing treatment protocols. Um, I know there was actually some uh, years ago, I was in meetings where the veterinary industry really redirect, you know, in in the um, in the human side, we have treatment guidelines. So, you know, the Infectious Disease Society of America has a whole list of uh, recommendations on how you actually treat different infectious diseases. And the veterinary industry really rejected that. And I think they've they've changed now. And I, I think a lot of times um, where you do have uh, the capability to doing lab work, they will do susceptibility testing. So they'll know what type of pathogens they have. And then they can kind of use... Uh, um, uh, then decide the treatment. So if you know your your um, you know your diseases are resistant to this antibiotic, you'll switch it out. Um, but I think a lot of times that's done through working with a uh, like a, a you know it's be through a veterinarian or a veterinarian's group. You know, I I don't know, Gail. I suspect those guys at Pipe Stem are pretty pretty up on that. <laughs> like the some of the big uh, pig vet uh, guys that also I think they produce pigs sort of. Yeah, there are, and, and it gets a little. It, it can get complicated because a lot of the the bigger places have you know one veterinarian who oversees you know literally hundreds of uh, facilities, and so they have standard operating procedures. Um, but there, are, I mean, there are veterinarians who will work with you and coming up with with standard operating procedures or SOPs for for your farm. And um, most veterinarians would would love to be more involved in preventative care. So Diane did add in the chat that it was a statement of info and responsibility and consent to treat. That's what she was asked by her veterinarian. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think that's that's getting to the veterinary client patient relationship so they want to make sure that they've got their legal backsides covered, I think. <laughs> so I think it's good to at least make your patient. So I mean half the times for my dogs, uh, my vet offers us too many antibiotics. So, <laughs> but uh... yeah, I mean, there's there's no reason, just like when you go to your physician or your, yeah, your physician, that you can't ask um, your your veterinarian. So why are why are you recommending this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to be aggressive about it, but just sort of ask. So so are, and is there something else I can do? Or if I do this, you know versus what you're recommending, um, what what do you think is likely to happen? Sometimes they've been answered, sometimes not. I mean, I when I was in practice, I um, would give antibiotics because people wanted to do something and I've gotten better about that, but I know there was a long time where it was like, oh yeah, I know, in my mind, I know it's a, a viral infection, but I, I also know that if the client didn't like me saying that and saying you just got to write it out they'd go down a dock down the road and that doc would give them an antibiotic me giving them an antibiotic wasn't any better then i started doing much more long conversations with my clients <laughs> yeah yeah well i think that's a lot of this is just having that relationship with your vet mm -hmm. um so how do you think uh the new fda requirement of requiring a prescription for all medically important antibiotics will affect the current level of antibiotic antibiotic use in livestock. Since added antibiotics are not available over the counter, they will need a veterinarian in order to have access to these antibiotics. I can, I can answer that one. <laughs> I, I mean, in terms of the, uh, the, the national use, I, I think those ones that um, uh, we're only a very small percentage of the sales. So you're not going to see it on the on the national level, whether it had an impact. I don't think it's going to be significant. I think where it may it has impact is where people have problems getting access to veterinarians. So it's more on um, individual farms in, in rural areas where there's not enough veterinary access, then that could be a significant challenge for those people. And it but I, I don't believe that it's going to significantly um uh, you know, reduce the amount of antibiotics that are being used on farms in the U.S. because those were injectables um, that were just a very small uh, part of the use. So, I mean, that's where I'd say. I think everyone would agree in principle it was a, a good idea, but it would be nice if if we had, you know, made sure everyone had access to veterinarians. It could, and I think there is telemedicine and there are things that can help with that, but I don't think we're where we need to be. Thank you, Steve. 
Um, somebody else asks, we use antibiotics only when necessary, maybe two to three times a year to address specific animals, specific, ugh, specific animals and specific illnesses. It is very worrying to me that we might not have access to, it, to general over-the-counter antibiotics because we only have one vet in our area who cannot always get to the farm to write a script in a timely manner. Can you speak to this? I think it's a very, very common fear among small far, small livestock producers in areas void of large animal veterinary assistance. I'm sorry, I just completely butchered that question. I don't know why I was having such a hard time reading this. But this is um, certainly something um, I'm a little concerned about because we do not have a lot of, I'm in a very urban area and we do not have a lot of, um, uh, we, we have like one vet that we can choose from, that's it. So yeah. I'm curious I, I to hear what you guys have to say. And, and um, I just went to a meeting where the uh, American Veterinary Medical Association is, is certainly trying to, to deal with this as well. Um, there are just not a lot of veterinarians, especially veterinarians who want to, to work on food animals in the pipeline. There's a bunch of veterinary schools that are opening, but they're running into trouble finding teachers to teach those. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that sort of gets back to getting involved nationally and, and working on um, uh, getting vet there are some programs that help get veterinarians to areas where they're needed um and that's especially for for food animal um veterinarians so i would um you know write sounds like you're not doing anything what you are is to, to write to your your member of congress um both your senators and and um, house representatives and say this is an issue this is a big problem for me i've got one doc and and she doesn't know anything about turkey she only knows about about dairy cattle now what am i supposed to do um i, I don't I, there i don't have another easy answer for you i wish i did yeah, yeah. the only other thing i would say is as gail said make sure you do have a relationship with that veterinarian and it's conceivable they um don't have to come out every time you need a script Right. I mean, that, the, the laws allow that. I mean, the big guys, believe me, <laughs> they don't send the vets out every time they use an antibiotic. I mean, they'll write an antibiotic prescription for 12 facilities at one time. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's, you know, the more you can have that relationship where you can describe the problem and see if you can get it, get it that way. I mean, that's, but uh, it, yeah, it's a problem. And we, we, we recognize that. Yeah, and and vet, I mean a veterinarian if if they don't have a good veterinarian if if she or he doesn't have have an answer it's just really not in their bailiwick they've got their own vet school if they're not in the area where they went to school or other veterinary schools and other um, um, colleagues that they can can call on and say okay I've 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 got a client who's who's raising guinea fowl and I do dairy so can you help me here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that is, um, we're asking a lot from our vets to be able to do everything, to do poultry, to do cattle, to do pigs, to do horses. And everybody seems to want to do horses. I guess there's more money in that. But. There's, more, there's a lot of money in horses. And there's a reason that most veterinarians go into um, companion animal practice, of which horses. Yeah. Also. yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's... Um, that basically ends our questions. If anybody else has anything they want to add before we go ahead and wrap this up, we're right at four o'clock. So that was perfect timing, guys. All right. So I have a few housekeeping items to share before we sign off today. A recording of this webinar and the slides will be available within the next few days. These documents will be archived on our website and I will email them to you all probably later on this afternoon. We, we also have some other good webinars coming up this uh, this winter. I will send links to all our upcoming webinars and other opportunities for farmers and ranchers in a follow-up email. Again, a sincere thank you to you, Gail, Madeline, and Steve. It has been a pleasure. It's really fun, especially to have uh, Madeline and Steve, and I loved meeting Gail. You had such, such good stuff to share. I appreciate it. And finally, I would like to thank everyone out there in the audience for their interest, attention, and fantastic questions. We had some really good ones this time. I hope that you had a good experience today, and we stay in touch and connect again soon. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye for now. Bye.